A much more convenient way to add vectors is the mathematical method. And what we need to do here is just get the components of each vector. Again, keep in mind that the vector is the hypotenuse of a triangle. So if we were to find the x component of the red vector, we'll call it r, we take the vector magnitude and multiply it by the cosine of the vector's angle with the x-axis. So this distance here, we get that from taking the, three, the uh, length of the red vector and multiplying it by this angle. That'll give us the x. It's 3.6 meters and 33.7 degrees. We get an x component for the red vector of 3 units. Then we want to find the y component. That requires the sine because that's the opposite side. 3.6 times the sine of 33.7 is 2 meters. We do the same thing with the blue vector. However, this is a little bit different. If we were to define our theta as counterclockwise from the negative x-axis, which would be this way, our theta is only 11.31 degrees. We can do that, and then we can do the, the same thing we did before. bx is b cosine theta, by is b sine theta. We get 5 and 1. The problem is these things actually point in the negative direction, both of them. So we have to put in that negative sign by hand. Now, if we had measured from the positive y or negative y axis, then we would have to swap cosine and sine. And that all gets a little bit complicated. So what's a little bit easier, it's, it's almost mindless, but that's not necessarily bad. If we always measure angles counterclockwise from the positive x, then the x component is always cosine and the y component is always sine. We also won't have to worry about the positive and negative signs in front of our components here. If we do that, the angle for the blue vector, instead of 11.3 south of west, it's 191.3. We go around half the circle and then down another 11.3 degrees. When we do this, 5.1 times cosine of an angle is automatically negative 5, and 5.1 times sine is automatically negative 1. And again, this is the convention that I'm going to stick to. The mathematical method for adding vectors is relatively simple. The first thing we do is find the x components and y components, then we add the x stuff together, then we add the y stuff together separately. And to, to make the resultant vector in both magnitude and direction form, we combine our x component total squared with our y component total squared, take the square root. That'll give us the magnitude. We find the direction using the arc tangent, just like we did before. The only problem with this, let's say, for example, we had added some vectors and we got x total was 3 and y total was 7. Our angle is 66.8 degrees, which is fine. However, you notice if we had gotten x total is negative 3 and y total is negative 7, we'd get the exact same answer from this arc tangent function, and it's really in the opposite direction. The reason for this is tangent is periodic over 180 instead of 360, so you just have to watch out for this. And what you can always do is make sure that when you have your final components, if you look at this, you realize this is in the third quadrant. So your answer, your angle is going to have to be somewhere between 180 and 270 degrees. So when you get 66.8 out of this, you realize you're going to have to add 180 degrees to that. Now we'll do a more complicated example. Let's say we have three vectors and they could be velocities. We want to add them up and see what we get. So for example, let's say you're on an aircraft carrier moving 15 meters per second to the east. The aircraft carrier's velocity vector is A. You're walking across the deck, perpendicular to it, to the north. Your velocity vector relative to the ship is vector B. While you're walking, you throw a rock 27 meters per second in a direction 31 degrees south of east. That'll be vector C. If someone's floating in the ocean, what's the speed of the rock? Well, to figure that out, they're going to have to add up these speeds of the ship and you walking and you throwing the rock but we have to add them in a particular way. We can't just add the numbers, we have to get the components because it doesn't make any sense to add things in the x direction to things in the y direction. So the first step is always going to be get the components. East is our plus x direction, so the aircraft carrier's velocity is easy. 15 times cosine of 0 is just 15. We have no y value because 15 times sine of 0 is 0. 
your walking across the deck is also pretty easy because you're walking 90 degrees to our, orient our uh, origin. So bx is 5 times cosine of 90. You have no x component to your velocity relative to the deck. You do have a y component, 5 meters per second. Finally, what about the rock? Here, its angle is going to be 211 degrees because remember we said we're throwing this thing 31 degrees south of east. So that would we'd have to add 180 to get 211 relative to east if we're going counterclockwise. 27 times cosine of 211 is negative 23.1. The y component, 27 times sine 211, negative 13.91. Now we add up the x pieces, 15 and 0 and negative 23. We get negative 8.1. We add up our y pieces, 0 and 5 and negative 13.9, and we get negative 8.9. Our magnitude, we use the Pythagorean theorem, we take the sum of the squares of the components, take the square root, we get 12.07 meters per second. And the direction, we take the arc tangent of y over x, we get 47.56 degrees. This 180 over pi is in here because this program, Mathematica, uses radians instead of degrees. Now the 47.56 degrees, this is an example of something that's wrong if we leave it like this, because notice total x and total y are both negative. We're really somewhere on the south side of west. So we're in the third quadrant. We have to add 180 and we get this time 227.6 degrees. We go through the same procedure whether you have two vectors or three or 500. It just is more tedious but it's the same idea. Subtraction would work the same way. We would just make the components of b negative if we wanted to find a minus b and add them together. Vectors can also be multiplied and there are two different ways to multiply them. We can put them together so that we get a scalar out of them or we can put them together so that we get a vector out of them. The scalar product is also known as the dot product. If we write uh, a dot b, what that means is take the x component of a, multiply it by the x component of b, add it to ay times by and in 3D we would have plus az times bz. With the vectors above, where a was the aircraft carrier and b was you walking perpendicular to its velocity, we would get zero out of that. Because if two vectors are perpendicular, their dot product is zero. The other way we could figure that out is to use the other method for finding the dot product. And that says we could take the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of the angle between them. So if we say f is c dot b, for example, the magnitude of c is, and this is our rock from before, this is going to be 27 meters per second, which we knew. The magnitude of b is 5. So if we take 27 times 5 and then the cosine of the angle between them, well, if c was at 211 degrees and b was at 90 degrees, the angle between them is 211 minus 90, or 121. So 27 times 5 times cosine of 121 is negative 69.5 for our dot product. We can check this with the component method if we take cx times bx and add it to cy times by, we get the same answer. You will probably end up getting a homework problem where they give you the components of two vectors and ask you for the angle between them. And what you would do is find the dot product with the component method and then you'd say, well, that has to be equal to this, and you can find the magnitudes easily enough. You solve for the cosine. You use the equality of the two ways to find dot product. This is going to be useful when we get to work, which will be a few chapters, but it's a dot product of force and displacement. So if we imagine we're pushing something along train tracks, it would have to be a pretty small train, uh, the displacement is this way, from the left to the right. The red arrow, all these three people who are pushing on it, the, the red arrow, that force, that person, this will be the most successful because there's zero angle between the direction you're pushing and the direction the thing is actually going. Cosine of zero is one, you'll get the maximum work out of this force. This person who's pushing a little bit of an angle will still make the car go forward, but not as effectively because we have this angle between force and displacement essentially part of their effort is wasted. This person with the blue arrow will do absolutely nothing because the 
perpendicular nature of the force and the displacement here means cosine of 90 is zero. They won't contribute at all to the speed of this rock or this car. We uh, have one other way to multiply vectors, and that's the cross product. This is what gives us a vector. In this case, rather than having the largest answer if two vectors are parallel, we get the largest answer if two vectors are perpendicular. So we could write g as a cross b, and one way to write that is magnitude of a times magnitude of b times sine theta, where it was cosine or the dot product. The vector product has to be 3D, since what we're going to find is this vector g is perpendicular to both a and b. If you wanted to do the component method, if you've had anything to do with matrices and determinants, this is really what you're finding. You've got a matrix that's i hat, j hat, k hat, components of A, components of B. You find the determinant of that. If you haven't seen that, this is the way you would find it with components, this formula. We're not going to have a, anything to do with cross product until we get the torques, which is about three quarters of the way through the course. Torque is the cross product of distance and force. So if you imagine you're trying to change a tire and loosen the lug nuts, being able to do it depends on three things. How strong are you? How long is the tire iron? And are you applying your force perpendicular to the tire iron? So if we look in this picture, the, on the left side here, this is going to be hard to break this lug nut loose because you're using a lot of force, but you've got a very short tire iron. It's very hard to do it. On the other hand, if you have a very long tire iron, but just a little tiny force, it'll still be a small overall result. Finally, on the far right, you've got a long tire iron, a lot of force. You're not using it the best way, though. Part of your effort is, is almost trying to snap off the lug nut rather than twist it. So the best possible way to do it would be long tire iron, 90-degree angle, 